And to take further look into the situation in southern Kaduna, I'm now being joined by Edify Yakusak, who is a research fellow and she's done quite a lot of work on the southern Kaduna crisis. Thank you so much for joining us on News at 10. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Now, um, a lot of things on the minds of people, this coming, this rapid um, you know, thing we're seeing with regards to the violence and especially Southern Kaduna. You've done a lot of work there yes. and you've heard about this recent violence. And some people are arguing this is a different place, but it's also in the same Southern Kaduna. What do you think could be responsible for this fresh violence in that area? Well, I think the current um, cycle of violence in Southern Kaduna has some, is something that has existed for years and has taken, it's the same thing that has taken different hurt, heads in the form of communal clashes, religious crisis, and um, headsmen farmer crisis. What I think is just one thing. It's a form of ethnic cleansing and genocide against the people of Southern Kaduna. I say so because if you look at the patterns of their attacks, the people are attacked and they are usually helpless and without any form of provocation, and they're just attacked. Helpless people, women and children inclusive, they are just killed, slaughtered in the most gore and bizarre way. So I feel it is a form of genocide against the people of Southern Kaduna. Why do you think security agencies haven't been able to nip this in the bud? We've heard that this has been ongoing maybe since, you know, the 80s, so to speak. Why haven't they been able to clamp down on this? Well, I think it's because um, the perpetrators have not been prosecuted. They've not even been arrested to a certain extent. I mean, we've had these clashes or this um, cycle of violence. I mean, I grew up knowing that Kaduna has always been attacked. And we cannot count a tangible number of people who have been arrested for the murder of r running into thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people over the years. So I think what the security agencies have not been able to get right is to be able to pinpoint who are the people behind this attack, what are the exact reasons behind these attacks, and to nip it there. So uh, people are also wondering, um, you mentioned women and children at the receiving end of this, yes. and 3,000, over 3,000 displaced at the moment. What do you think they, they need to do to protect them? I mean, there are fears of reprisal attacks, and we're hoping that doesn't happen, doesn't come to that. Well, the, the uh, situation in Kajuru now is it's really sad, much more than being sad, is a humanitarian crisis, because you have over 3,000 people in the camps, I'm sure more than half are women or children, 40 of which I heard a pregnant woman and a thousand are children. So, and these are the most vulnerable people in our society. So I think um, much more than protecting them, they need relief materials, they need help, they need all the emotional and psychological support they can get. Yes. With regards to what happened in um, Sangha, the situation less than 24 hours ago, yes. um, would you say that Southern Kaduna is unsafe? Well, I think putting it on, calling Southern Kaduna unsafe is putting it mildly. Southern Kaduna is, I, for lack of a better word, I'm going to use a war zone right now. Because it has happened in Kajuru and it's happening in Sangha. Where could be next? Would it be Kagoro or Kagoma or Ataka? We don't know. Because these attacks, we only know that they attack people from a particular region. We don't know where it's going to be next. So I think security is a basic necessity that the state has to provide for its people. And the people in Southern Kaduna are not secure. So I, I, I think South, Southern Kaduna should be in a state of emergency as we speak. A lot of people are hoping that this really ends as quickly as possible. But um, when we look at the government, yes. um, successive governments yes. uh, in Kaduna, would you say they've, they've done um, anything to, to stem this violence? Well, I, I wouldn't say they've done nothing, but despite their efforts, this thing has still continued. These killings have, seen, uh, have continued, and now, this is 2019, right from um, when the new government took in power um, in 2015, and up to now, there have been a series of killings, and still, these things are still happening. So I think they, it still rests in their hands to do much more than they have done. And I, I feel, to a certain extent, it's the, the government should contribute, should play a greater role in stopping these attacks. Because we, they have the, uh, the force of the military, they have the police, and we've seen what they have done, um, that they, have, is, they, are doing, they, are not, um, they are not helping out, not because they are incapacitated or lack of resources, because we've seen their, what they've done with, um, when they, with the Shiites and the Biafra agitators. But I think it's 
possibly because of uh, lack of political will to do so, or for some reason, I don't know. So if, if there was one thing, a yes. uh, solution that you would prefer for, for what's happening there, what would it be? Well, I think it still lies on the government. Because we, uh, the people of Southern Kaduna, as a people, have done their best. They've run, they've, they've tried to start dialogue with um, faceless perpetrators, and it has gotten nowhere. So I, Some people are also saying there are certain root causes, maybe poverty, uh, you know, low economy, po po uh, okay. lack of jobs. Are these on, root on the causes side, on, could... on the side of the, um, of the faceless perpetrators or on the side of the people of the Southern Kaduna? Because I can assure you, the people of the Southern Kaduna are not killing themselves. People who they don't know are killing them. All right. Well, I should thank you so much, Edifai. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Yakuse, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.